Welcome all and thank you for joining today's AWRI webinar. My name is Robin Dixon and I'm a senior viticulturist at the AWRI. I'm joining you today from Ghana land and in the spirit of reconciliation, the AWRI acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I would also like to acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for webinars via the AWRI Extension Project. So in this session today, we will look at soil health and soil water holding capacity. So given the um, large number of people who have registered for this webinar, um, there's a lot of interest in this topic, which is great to see. Um, so before we jump in, uh, just have a few reminders. So this webinar is being recorded as always. So anyone who has registered for the event will be sent a recording of the webinar via our YouTube channel. And also you have the ability to ask questions at any stage during the webinar using the Q&A button down below. Um, so really encourage um, you to uh, throw us any questions and we will uh, look at answering those at the end of the webinar in our Q&A session with both Kiara and Jeremy. Uh, so for anyone who has just joined, welcome. Today's webinar topic is soil health and soil water holding capacity. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Kiara Pasut from the CSIRO and Jeremy Nelson from the Murray Lands and Riverland Landscapes Board. So first up, we will hear from Dr. Kiara Pasut. So Kiara is a soil biogeochemist modeler with a particular interest in the interactions between organic carbon and nitrogen in soils and the importance of these on ecosystem function and agricultural productivity. She has recently joined the CSIRO and her research concentrates on monitoring and modeling soil carbon stocks and flows through agricultural systems, including land management, soil water dynamics, transport and fate of chemical species and biophysical processes linking nutrient cycles, plants and soil microbial communities. So all amazing stuff. Um, the final target includes the accounting of greenhouse gas emissions, carbon and nitrogen stocks in soil and ecosystem services and sustainability. So uh, we are in good hands here learning about soil health and um, today Kiara will be focusing on um, soil health and water holding capacity. Thank you, Kiara. If you're ready, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Robin. Can you see, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thanks everybody for joining us and let's kick in. I'll just start, oh, if my computer decides to work, oh, yes. I'd like to uh, respectfully acknowledge the Guana people as traditional owner and custodian of the land in which my research takes place. I'm based in Wade Campus in Adelaide, and I'll pay my respects to the elder past and present. So let's start. So the big question today is about soil health. But what soil, how can we define uh, and describe if a soil is healthy or not? Well, in soil science, we love talking about the soil sponge concept. What is it? So if we take, for example, a piece of rock, it's a consolidated material that nothing can grow on it. Water cannot flow in, nothing. It's just bare soil, nothing, a piece of rock, nothing. On the other hand, healthy soil is about emptiness. So 30, between 30 to 40% of our soil is based on uh, voids. These voids. The, the other 60%, on the other hand, <coughs> sorry, I have a little bit of a cough, and is mineral particles, together with roots, which release organic carbon and organic materials. 
But that's not what is just the healthy soil. The healthy soil also has fungi and bacteria. Those are essential to make everything working and stick together and process the organic matter and make it as a, like a sticky glue that gets uh, together with the mineral part and get associated and stick together and create this beautiful 3D web that can hold and help to keep the water there and make it available for water, but also help to the fungi and bacteria to keep going and process more organic matter and make all the nutrients available. So what is the healthy soil at the end? Healthy soil is not just about emptiness, but it's also the type of soil that you have, about water, soil organic matter, plants and biodiversity, so fungi, bacteria. There's a lot of concepts that I want to like go through my presentation, different parts, how to manage it, how to, what to touch to increase it or to maintain it. And probably Jeremy will go even to in much detail with like some specific field try that he did with amazing results. So mine was just presentation introduction of the problem and it will give you much more uh, a focus on some experience and field trial. So why we're doing this, because so many threats on the soil health, it's physical, chemical, and biological. It can be erosion, nutrient problems, too much nutrients, lack of nutrients, salinity is another problem, lack of carbon content, <laughs> or problem with biodiversity, you don't have much uh, bacteria, fungi that can help you to process different types of nutrients. And there's different ways to overcome this problem is trying to have a different or a better floor management. So that's the reason why this presentation go different or well, touch different um, topic and see what's the best management to or different management that you're doing now, try to increase in or maintain soil health. Um, so the first thing that you saw in a healthy soil, in the first couple, first slide is the healthy soil is the, the drivers is the soil organic matter. What is soil organic matter? It's not just about carbon. Your soil is not healthy just because it has a lot of carbon, but it has all the nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur. That's what is organic, soil organic matter. So it's just carbon, is carbon and the other nutrients. Why they're so important? Because they're sticky and they help you to improve the structure of your soil and hold water and give you in this way a resilience for the future. So it helps you to decrease your irrigation and also fertilizer. But how does it work? Uh, one second, I have to move this one here. So how does it work, the nutrient cycle in your soil? There's a lot of, it's a big question right now, how to manage it in agriculture. So everything starts from the atmosphere. We have the CO2 which is trapped from the plant and photosynthesized and use it to grow. And then they produce litter. What is the litter? It's like a leaf falling, roots dying, or a branch falling on the floor. And they get into the soil. So from the plant, the carbon get into the soil. The first stage is called particular organic matter. It's the bulky stuff, the, the thick and complex molecular and they have both carbon and nitrogen and other micro and micronutrients. Normally, the amount of carbon is way higher because they and <clears throat> so they're very bulky and difficult to to process from bacteria. Especially, they take one to fifty years to stay in your soil. Thanks to the bacteria, they start processing and eating them and breaking down in more simple molecular. And those process makes available and, and for like they release nutrients, they make nutrients available again to the plant and also create a sticky material that can get associated with your soil with your soil and get mineral associated organic matter. And that one is the stock. It's what makes resilience in your soil, what help you in the future. Normally that one has a better ratio between carbon and nitrogen. Why we're always talking about carbon, but also other nutrients, because soil organic matter, as I said, is everything is not just carbon. During this process, we release also in organic nitrogen. They can help you with uh, less use of fertilizer, depends on the type of health, the quality of your soil organic matter that we'll see in a few next slides. We also have the nitrogen cycle included. But how do we apply this to your vineyard? 
in your vineyard, you're actually quite lucky in, compared to other industry in your in uh, in the agriculture because you're you have a plan to stay there all over the year. Once it's established, stay there for at least 20, 15 years. And you also have you always have above and below ground litter. So the above ground is, for example, here you have leaves and branches that are falling in the ground. The roots are always there. So you still have a good amount of carbon going in, carbon and nitrogen and other nutrients. But at the same time, you have to account for losses. In your case, the biggest losses is the fruit. So you, of course, produce wine. So you need to collect the grapes. Also pruning, depends on how you process the pruning. If you have cover crops, eh, but you have grazing, there's another loss. So carbon accounting, or in general, when you do nutrient accounting, very complex at the same time, because you need to account for every input, whatever it is, including fertilizer, compost, but also every output. Could be fire, could be grazing, could be pruning. So how do we increase it? How do we increase the, our amount of, of nutrients? Well, one of the first things, and one of my favorite as well, is cover crops because the co-benefits they can give you there are so many. Yes, they can increase first soil organic carbon for the simple fact the more crops you have, more carbon input you have in your soil. They can increase your nutrients, uh, your nitrogen. Depending on the type of uh, plant that you use, you can have nitrogen fixation. So you can have a plant that takes the nitrogen from the atmosphere and release it into your soil. That will help you to reduce your nitrogen fertilization. It can also increase, improve the availability of phosphorus. First, phosphorus is likes to be bind on your soil for because they're different charges, so they like to be attracted. So it can be there in your soil, most likely they can be available. But because you have biodiversity in your soil, that makes help to have a different type of fungi, particularly the mycorrhizal. They can help you to take that not available phosphor and make it available. That's a really important thing. They can help you with soil erosion. They have extra roots. They can hold your soil to so avoid uh, a lot of runoff. They can improve the biodiversity in your soil. They can also help uh, to reduce evaporation. And in case like this couple of years, they're really wet. They can actually help you to drain water out of your soil. It won't be too wet. They depend a lot on your soil and Jeremy will go much better in detail. You can choose different species and play around. Doesn't matter if you're rain, if you're in a region with no problem water or limited amount of water, there's different management that you can apply and increase your structure in the soil. One example, there's a lot of, well, one, <coughs> there's many examples, especially in um, limited rain region. Maybe start having like um, annual uh, cover crop and um, prepare your soil during winter time when you don't have problem with water and you don't have any competition. Then leave it there as mulch. But Jeremy, I, I, I will here go quite quick because Jeremy will talk much better than me here with more examples. One of the things that I want to just show you is this, choose wisely your cover crop. Understand first your soil, understand where is your water table, understand how deep are your, your roots. Because if you have very deep roots, that almost there close to the water table, you don't want competition there. So you can choose a shallow um, cover crop with a shallow root, so there's no competition nutrients and also water. On the other hand, if you have shallow roots and you want to break down your compacted soil, you may want to choose um, deeper and more structured uh, <coughs> cover crop that can help you to break down create more structure and do not compete with your um, with your vine. So just understand first what you have, maybe talk to neighbors, understand what they're using, if they're really trying, and trying to find the best match for your soil. That's very important. Another way to increase soil organic carbon is through compost. Mulch doesn't actually interact that much with the, with the soil organic carbon, but can help in some cases. I'll show you later with temperature. My compost for sure, it does. And it's a solar organic, it's stabilized organic matter. So it's already 
being processed, so it's already available, so it's full of nutrients. It'll improve the structure by also stimulate the, the microbial and fungi. And uh, what's the difference between the two of them? It's very important. They interact completely in a different way. Compost, you, you know, you put it on the top of the soil. So how does it go? The car out the carbon go or nutrients go from the top of the soil to your actual soil. You need precipitation, first of all, and also worms. Worms will eat them, eat the compost, and then move down and start doing uh, perturbation of your soil. So that's how carbon generally moves through compost. Normally, compost interact with the nutrients only on the first 10 to 15 centimeters of soil, so the very top soil. On the other hand, uh, this one, <laughs> um, Cover crops work completely different. The release of carbon is following the growth of the plant. And also in terms of quality is very diverse because we have very simple molecular from the below ground, from the roof exudates, but we have also more complex on the above ground depending on the type of crop. Also cover crop has been found to increase the mycorrhizal fungi population, which is amazing because it will help you to have better um, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, nutrient cycle, especially for phosphorus and, and nitrogen. There's another big question, unfortunately, that is coming out recently is about N2O emission, uh, particularly if, if you're using cover crops that fix nitrogen. Science has not announced it yet. We haven't understood the problem completely. There is what well, we the recent study has found an increase in emission, of course, because you have more nitrogen available. But in case of cover crops, they also saw that after a few years, because the microbial population was getting more stable and the form of nitrogen is different compared to, for example, uh, in, uh, inorganic fertilization, that the emission were just getting stable and not too high. So this is, uh, I, will hope, I hope in a few years we'll have a better answer, but this is also something that you should take account if you want to do uh, the net uh, zero certification for your farm. When, uh, this is another case study in the morning to peninsula. Unfortunately for you, carbon cycle is very slow. So you can start applying now, you won't see a result next year, but in a few years, this is a trial of four years, this has actually seen quite good results. This case was about saving water because they saw that there was much more structure in their soil after applying for four years. And also a lot of the microbial uh, activity was enhanced. So quite, quite good result, but uh, takes time, be patient for that. And on the side of nutrients, as I said before, they're very important. And my advice would start uh, testing your soil, first thing. Understand not just the total carbon, not just the total nitrogen or the total phosphorus, but understand in which pool they are, if they're available or not. First thing, because they, you might have a problem of pH. The pH control the availability, so that could be one thing. Another thing is that you might have a lack of different uh, fungi that can help you to release the nutrients in your cycle, back in your cycle, for example, the mycorrhizal. And also you can play around with different, in this picture is like different type of um, cover crops. So if you already have a lot of nitrogen, there's no point to increase your nitrogen, uh, nitrogen fixation through a cover crop. So you can choose one that's less. Uh, affect your nitrogen. On the other hand, if you need it, it's better to use uh, clover, for example, the fixed nitrogen. And just a matter, understand first your soil. That's the best starting point for everything. And then uh, decide what's next uh, and what's the next management. As I said before, it's not just about, oops, sorry, about carbon, it's also about all the nutrients. If you want to do carbon farming, if your goal is to try to stock carbon in your soil, you have to think about nitrogen as well. It's the same for us. If we want to build muscle going to the gym, we need protein. The same is for bacteria. They need protein to grow and build carbon. So a rule of thumb is that we need roughly one tons of nitrogen to stock around 12 tons of carbon in our soil. 
And there's few studies, especially for the grain industry, they even do the apply normally 45 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen. That is enough to get the best yield, but unfortunately it's not enough to stock carbon. You need to think if you are fertilizing, if you are having a cover crop, you need to think you might need more, a little bit more nitrogen to help your bacteria to fix the, the carbon. So understand the healthy soil, it's not just about carbon, but it's also about all the other nutrients. And another thing that I always like to talk about it for healthy soil is biodiversity. Monoculture, unfortunately, attracts only specific things because the quality of the litter, of the quality of the plants, attract only one or two things. If you have a biodiversity on the topsoil, from the above ground, that means that you have different input on your soil in terms of quality and quantity that will help you to give you a different community of bacteria and fungi and help you with more nutrients availability is simple but it also help you for pests and um, pest control because if you think if you have a very diverse community it's very difficult for one to overcome and become a pest there's more control on that so it could really help you out um, and this is about like the soil organic matter and soil organic carbon, but how do we manage the physical part, the physical problem? The physical problem is more about erosion and loss of physical structure, and they're mostly based on the water cycle. We can work on precipitation, but what we can is try to reduce the runoff and um, evaporation in trying to increase as, possible, as, much, as much as possible the soil storage, the water soil storage. So keep the water there, make it available for the plant and bacteria as well. For a healthy soil, it means that we are reducing the runoff, so the loss of water, the overflow, increase the infiltration by reduce as much, not as much, but reduce the drainage, so the quick loss of your topsoil, so the water can stay there. You say that, yeah, that's depending on the type of soil, of course. So if you have a clay soil, it's unlucky. It's an easy job. But sometimes if you have too much clay, you may have too much runoff because the infiltration will be, be very um, poor. If you have a sandy soil, unfortunately, you have more infiltration and more loss in drainage. But there's way and way to work out and, and trying to change and increase your structure, especially if you increase a little bit of your soil organic method. But there's other way also to have a, a different floor management. For example, try to avoid compaction, try to reduce your use of tractor when you don't need it. You first reduce your emission, but you also reduce compaction. So if you compact the soil, so if we say that 40% of your soil is empty, more you compact, less water, it can stay in that volume. So you will have more runoff and an increase and in loss in, um, in, um, in erosion. Bare soil, bare soil is beautiful. It's always been like this for the last hundred years, but sometimes it's just there. It's just uh, stay under the sun and precipitation massive loss of carbon through erosion and most of the time we always forget about erosion but you can lose up to 30 percent of your carbon in some cases so pay attention on that especially in these few years that have been super wet and some way to manage this is through cover crop as i said cover crop has a, an extra root so it can help to hold your soil can also help to increase uh, perturbations to have more structure in your soil, reduce evaporation. You have an extra canopy that protects from temperature for high temperature. And also, if you have very compacted clay, which in some cases could be, you need like you can choose a good uh, cover crop with a good set of roots that break down the clay and help to filtrate the water, so you won't have too much uh, runoff. And this is the most like immediate uh, thinking of the physical possibility to in not having a healthy soil. But there's a different threat that some people always, always think about it. And sometimes it's pest and weed control. Pest and weed control, they interact with the plant in general. 
sometimes they're they're very well designed right now we our chemicals are really well set but some when they break down in the soil they may produce some side product they can interact with the root exudate or the plant itself decreasing the amount of carbon release in the in the soil but they can also be toxic to some microbial and fungi stopping the cycle of the nutrient cycle in your soil so compromise the actual availability and the creation of the stickiness material that can help to hold the water in your soil on the other hand synthetic fertilizer they are like sugar they when you put them everybody are happy they start burning everything all the soil organic matter so in the long term you lose a lot in a very short time period that's the reason why using cover crops, using different ways to fertilize or make and nitrogen available can help you to control instead of having spike over time, having like a more controlled carbon cycle and nitrogen cycle. Another aspect is not just about water, it's also about temperature. Temperature affects the plant, of course, but also affects the water available in your soil. Higher temperature increases the evaporation. So a good way to manage is having, for example, a winter cover crop, then leave it there as much for summer. But, uh, and this, this is a study in the US from some colleagues. I've been doing different cover crops and they see that the one, which is uh, the, the green one, the one with oats, the one that can control as much better the temperature over time. But a thing that I wanna highlight is that Temperature affect also the carbon and, and the nutrient cycle in general. Bacteria likes warm temperature. And we're seeing way high temperature. Even spring, the temperature is higher than normal. And that is speeding up our carbon cycle and nutrient cycle. We're losing a lot of our nutrients just because the temperature in our soil is very high. And that because the bacteria are growing and burning and producing a lot of CO2. That's the reason why if you can control the soil temperatures, decreasing even one or two degrees, they actually help to slow down and keep the nutrients in our soil rather than just in the atmosphere. Another problem I just want to highlight is about salinity solidity. So it used to be addressed only for a full water quality, but we are seeing a lot of change in precipitation. China just declared one of the driest summer in the last 100 years, Europe as well, and then floods here. We've been under three years of floods, but it was a drought for, for, for two years before that, before 2019. So then precipitation are changing significantly, it means the water table are changing in terms of height significantly as well. Re-changing all the nutrient concentration in our soil it means that it could happen that even places where it never been a problem, the water quality is good, can start having problems with salinity. So pay attention and keep, unfortunately, testing for that because once the problem is established, it's kind of be a big problem and takes time to fix it. But a way to fix it or to keep in control is uh, calculating an extra leaching rate. This could be done in different way, and you can change if you have bad. If you already know that you have bad quality water for irrigation, you can change. You can try to have a better water quality. You can try to design a drainage to help to flush out the extra concentration of salt. You can also think to have um <coughs> sorry um um sorry uh winter irrigation as well. So you keep cleaning and washing out your soil you can also try to divert the precipitation so this is the normal management of vineyards you have the mid row and the two lines of vine normally the um, the leaching rate is greater in the mid row and less in the mid vine because of the transpiration of the plant diverting the precipitation from the mid row to the vine you increase the water to the vine so you will have an increase of, of leaching to the mid, uh, to the vine. So helping in the in in the place that you actually need. This was a study done in McLaren Bay a couple of years ago, and we saw a reduction of forty percent of salinity on the vine, which is 
quite a big improvement for uh, for salt. And um, the last you've been hearing talking to me for like the last twenty minutes, and it's like, why do we have to do this? Is it? Well, we see just as I said, precipitation temperature change, and we have to adapt or trying to get better, and we need a way of to be resilient for the future, especially because water is one of the most important factors to produce good wine. But also because this is a study that been conducted in Cicero 10 years ago about soil organic carbon in agriculture. And we can see in the last 100 years, we have been losing carbon. So the agriculture sector is losing carbon, but there are exceptions in this study. And the exception where we were, where some growers trying to do conservation agriculture, trying to go against them and trying to alleviate constraints. And I think you are in a lucky sector because, as I said, you always have a plan there. You always have a release of carbon compared to other agriculture sector. You can start leading that that movement to change and have a different, more resilient agriculture. Because as we probably already saw this live many times in the last couple of years have been we have been trying to get back to what it used to be or at least trying to get better so we were in a steady state before the industrial area we start cultivating we start losing carbon or soil health in general now we understand that we we can try to put something for example compost that will increase and give up their yield their soil better water management we think we're happy, we're done, so we stop and we go back to another, and we go back down. So we learn the rules, we learn the lesson, sorry. And we, and we start doing something different. We keep doing, the key here is keep doing and keep trying different things and keep maintaining what we have. And my last message is trying to keep thinking that it's not just about carbon, it's not just about water, it's all about everything and every action interacts with another one. And your soil is quite complex, unfortunately, I'm sorry, <laughs> it is. But it can be managed and it can be increase our soil health. And it also, it's also quite a juggle, as I like to say, about money, chemicals and water. But if you are able, in if you're able to have a different management and the perfect, and there's no perfect management for everybody that is very soil dependent and property dependent, but try to have as much as biodiversity as possible, and that will help with soil structure and nutrient availability. Um, then I'm done. <laughs> I'm talking, and thank you for listening to me. If you have any question, I'll be here for all the webinar. But also, if you have other extra question, this is my email. Please. And an email. I'm always happy to have a chat. And thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Kiara. Um, I've heard you speak quite a number of times now, and um, I never get tired of it. It's uh, real soil health 101. Um, so thank you very much for a really informative um, presentation. So essentially. Plants are key, play a key role in um, building soil carbon and soil health, um, but you need to feed the plants and the microbes to build soil carbon. So I like your analogy of needing protein um, and the gym to build muscles. Um, the um, slide you had with the different lengths of the or depths of the root growth uh, was really great um, and and it, um, your explanation that biodiversity is key um, super interesting about the one ton of nitrogen required to build 12 tons of carbon so um, and then the thought I'd like to um, uh, get others to think about the importance of using um, non-synthetic fertilizers to, to really feel, feed those um, plants and microbes instead of these synthetic fertilizers that, as you say, burn through the organic matter. Um, so some real gold in there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now I'd like to um, introduce 
Jeremy Nelson. So Jeremy Nelson is a project officer in the sustainable agriculture team of Murraylands and Riverland Landscape Board. So after completing his studies, he did a stint in viticulture in the Adelaide Hills, and then he moved to the Riverland to pursue his interests in irrigation uh, resource management. So participating in the drought mitigation study, uh, strategies during the millennial drought. Um, he has uh, worked in the dairy, broadacre and pivot agriculture industries in the South Australian Murray-Darling Basin. Um, and now he is working uh, in the Riverland area on sustainability, soil sustainability in viticulture. Um, and he's got some really amazing um, trial results um, from his four year, I think it is four year trial in the Riverland um, that really reinforce some of the messages that Kiara um, has provided us with today. Um, so if you're ready to start, I'll hand over to you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robin and Kiara. And um, I think we can certainly agree that Kiara just gave us a really good nuts and bolts of um, how it all works and um, the project work that we're doing um, up in the Riverland. If I can make my thing move. Sorry guys, I'm just a bit stuck here. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, it's certainly uh, endorsing, you know, that, that whole thing about the whole productivity of the viticultural system and um, the soils themselves, the productivity within those soils. Just quickly, some acknowledgements there, just back to our own board. Um, the National Land Care Program, which has funded this uh, particular project, and um, also to CCW Accolade, which is a large grower group in the Riverland that um, has supported this project very well and has uh, really helped us to make a good go of it over the past four years. And of course, to the Australian Wine Research Institute as a uh, project partner and um, advocate for this research. So the issues in the Riverland um, are similar to other regions. Uh, they're intensively irrigated, drip irrigated predominantly. So you're focusing a lot of water into one very restricted area within the overall hectare per vineyard, which creates issues in terms of soil structure. Um, certainly a tradition of synthetic fertilizer use and uh, with the River Murray water resource, there is, of course, the issues each year with not only salt, but also colloidal matter coming in through the irrigation systems um, and also going directly into the soil itself. Um, viticulture is pretty much a controlled traffic sort of system. So there's various contributors there to soil compaction, apart from propensity for the soils themselves. Um, to become less structured and more compacted over time. And this has led to issues with infiltration, particularly it's been one of the biggest issues noted uh, in more recent years. And this is all linked to, of course, a very reduced soil biology, very, very, very almost non-existent levels of soil organic carbon. And uh, this has contributed to uh, quite an outbreak uh, in places, You're just getting weaker vines. They've got restricted root zones because the nutritional root zone in the hydrated root zone is quite small. You're getting anaerobic conditions because of poor infiltration, et cetera. And this leads to flow on issues with vine health through root rots and other such um, diseases. Um, and this year is really impacting growers over time. Just a quick snap, um, disregard the hose running down the middle. That was done for a, um, a salt bush uh, interrow trial. That, that's a sort of classic sort of sandy loam soil top that we're running on at the Monash trial site. The soils themselves um, have uh, very, as you can see, very low organic carbon levels. Uh, there's a soil pit in that particular soil top that we're talking about there in the Barmara land system. Um, you can see the onset there of heavy 
carbon that's there from about 40 centimetres and beyond. And this has the action of actually restricting the rooting area somewhat of the vine to the top 40 centimetres. So from an irrigation and nutrition management perspective, we are talking per hectare about really a veneer of soil on the top of the land surface there that's about 40 to 50 centimetres thick. So everything that happens, happens there. Uh, the pHs do creep up, of course, um, further down uh, the soil profile. Um, overall, it's not too bad a soil. It does have some issues there, obviously, with salts. And that um, if you dig down deep enough, you will find is linked to um, you know, around the dripper zone. There is a halo of salts uh, in most vineyards within the Riverland that um, reveal the action of salt import over time and then salt evaporation or getting left behind essentially in, in the soil profile. Overall, um, we looked, we're more interested in really within this project at looking at, really it was a process of rediscovery. We, we wanted to get growers thinking about how to get past these issues that were uh, really becoming quite severe and um, impacting on vineyards and reducing vine productivity and vine health like we're sort of at the point in some places where it's the annual mapping of how many vines are dying back in places. So it's quite a, a serious problem in that sense. And the problems aren't just limited. It's not as simple as our trial work will fix this, but these sorts of symptoms are reflecting a, a vineyard or a viticultural system that is obviously struggling. So we uh, really wanted to look at the effects following on from Chiara's presentation of actually introducing extra biomass into the system and actually seeing what we could generate in terms of improved soil biology and whether we could actually revive in, in systems that have been run on synthetics for years natural nitrogen mineralization, a increase in soil biota, fungus in particular is very low. So good fungi to bacteria ratios, want to see a bit of nitrogen fixation. Um, so we've integrated legumes in some systems there. We're looking at seeing that uptake in tissue and looking at the soil structural aspects around that. The other branch that was a couple other branches of the trial. The other branch was looking at uh, composted organic matter. And so we picked on the waste stream from viticulture, which is great, Mark, which we acknowledge does have potassium management issues, but it is readily available. And when composted, it, it seemed like a reasonable sort of option, albeit with a management caveat um, to deploy that back into the, into the system. And we've done that. And then we've got another branch or two of the trial. They're looking at the organic injectables, we call them, which are really a mixture of humate-based products. Some of them have bacillus inoculations. So we've been looking at uh, basically as much as we can at the soil biology under those systems. And then, yeah, we did a bit of a ripper trial on the side, which was more of a trial of ripper type rather than the effects of ripping. So a couple of crops, um, and there's some good shots of them there that we've tried. It was a process of elimination. Uh, tillage radish, uh, medic ryegrass, a green manure mix, which has got um, a mixture of legumes and grasses basically in, in it. Uh, we did a bit of interrow stuff, and then we've got loose and, and chicory. And so out of those ones, we've pretty much wound back to dropping chicory out. Uh, even though chicory is really good as a perennial, it takes too much out of the system. And we've focused more so on tillage radish, medic ryegrass, and loosen in the green manure mix. And you can see in the graph there that there's some quite, we've done biomass monitoring at the site and found some quite good levels of annual biomass uh, production there. And that's part of the story. So you've got to think for a second what we're actually doing here is we're coming in post-harvest 
in about May, May to June, and aiming to get cover crops going towards the end of that season while there's still some heat in the ground and getting some germination going and hopefully picking up, snagging some early rainfalls so they can grow right through the winter period when the vine is dormant. And so what we're actually doing there is we're boosting the productivity of that system in terms of its capacity to grow biomass and particularly root biomass, which is what we're really interested in. Um, we don't harvest any of the biomass or do anything with it, but what we've found now is the most beneficial thing to do is to, to, in a system like this, which is quite arid, is to terminate it out by about October, early October, late September, so that it doesn't become too competitive with the vine. And then what generally happens is the biomass will just fold into the vine row itself and create a really nice mat of biomass, which will reduce your soil temperatures. It creates habitat for a lot of arthropods and a lot of species of insects, which are basically breaking down large aggregates of organic matter. And then the biota underneath that is basically living off of a lot of the available carbon resources that are growing from the uh, root mass that's now becoming a defunct sort of organic matter resource in the soil. Uh, in terms of our organic matter incorporation, um, we've seen some fairly staggering results, I must be honest, in terms of the increases in um, particularly the inert carbon uh, fraction of the organic carbon that we measure. Um, so just in a nutshell, what we're monitoring, particularly in a basic sense, this would be really, for somebody like Kiara, this is like very sort of oversimplified, but when we send... Uh, um, samples off to the lab, we get a, a, a reading in labile carbon. Labile carbon is really, really, really fine organic matter that's part of the organic carbon fraction, which is termed labile or really available. So that's going to be a ready fuel source for your microbes, essentially. And it's sort of implying a, uh, a functional aspect of that soil organic carbon resource, whereas the inert the inert and resistant fraction is stuff that's uh, it's very it's a lot harder. It's a lot more complex in its uh, structure. It will break down, but it will take a lot lot longer. And so, the resistant and inert fraction there, you can see of the great mark as it builds up in the soil, can be quite high. What we haven't deduced yet is just well, really, the hazards in relation to potassium management are probably largely linked, we believe, to the labile C element and the resistant inert as it slowly strips back and the labels reduced out of the system. We're hopeful that that resistant inert fraction will offer much less in terms of a K um, hazard for the vineyard. But you can see there that, um, well, if I showed you the statistics, that uh, we've managed to boost organic carbon levels in the soil from about 0.8 at the start of the project to about 2.27 in year three. So it's a fairly significant increase. And with that increase comes a whole heap of changes in soil biology, a massive upsurge in fungus, um, which in itself is breaking down the labile fraction, particularly of the biomass and all of that extra available carbon that's there. With the cover crops, um, and these are direct under the vine cover crops, they're not interro cover crops. Um, you're seeing there actually some pretty, uh, I think that overall that cover crops um, offer a really great solution for viticulturalists everywhere in terms of, they're a bit of a silent achiever. They don't cost a huge amount to actually put into the ground, but you can see there that over time, they do, particularly in the medic ryegrass example there and the radish, um, they are boosting organic carbon. And a significant part of that is termed resistant and inert, but it wouldn't be quite as hard as what we're talking about within the great mark itself, within the seeds and everything within that mark. But nonetheless, it's quite a good resource. And as I said, there's a lot of biological um, improvements associated with that in the soil, which we are seeing. Um, 
to focus a bit more on the actual links with carbon and moisture, though, um, as Kiara was pointing out earlier, you know, in the mineral soil, which um, becomes sort of quite structuralist over time without carbon inputs into the system. And I'll just sort of throw a thought out there. And most of the systems I work in, in the sort of northern part of the basin area, what we'd call the overall primary productivity of the system um, in terms of biomass production and, um, and with the interactions with climate, the soil organic carbon levels aren't changing. And agriculture is generally a process of harvesting both nutrients and then biomass out of the system. So if the organic carbon levels aren't changing after a 20 to 30 year period, it's pretty indicative that the system itself is, is basically just treading water. Everything that's produced is basically consumed either by microbes or through the actions of climate oxidation or through the, the, the effects of actually removing uh, removing uh, contributions of the grain each year out of the system. And this has implications for irrigation management. And what we're noting and what we'll look at shortly is some direct examples of what we're finding in terms of moisture retention. Um, just a quick couple of uh, picks there. Um, the one there on the left-hand side is a very simplified sort of portrayal of the effects of organic carbon and just how it, it's not a great, great illustration by any means. Um, I would have loved to have had some more detailed sort of um, images in this presentation on that, but basically you're creating pore space and attraction to the water molecules. So when you've got extra carbon in the system, the drainage aspect starts to modify. And looking at that graph on the uh, right-hand side there, which has been based on the largest study that was done some years ago, you begin to alter the actual drainage characteristic of the soil itself. So it begins to hold more moisture, and then that alters the whole field capacity aspect of the soil type. So in that particular graph, we can see the red monitoring points there are, are you know, basically your control monitoring and the uh, the grey triangles represent a soil monitoring where they've actually increased the organic carbon content and then done basically like a sort of matrix study to look at the uh, the water retention curves and the, and the water retention behaviour in the soil. And certainly that's something that we've seen in this trial is that we're getting much better moisture retention and much better infiltration in our soil type. The uh, bulk density, which I'll just touch on briefly of the, of the sandy loam soil type there, you can see in the control, gets up really quite high to about 1.77 grams per cubic centimetre. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can see probably the one to look at there, though. I mean, the ripping comparisons aren't really much of a comparison from a bulk density perspective, but it's the uh, tillage radish um, is showing you the effects of actually having a root in the system there. After about three years, the little tubular nature of, it's basically like a little mini carrot growing adjacent the vine, either side of the vine, and just the actions of the feeder roots that come out from the radish and all of the cover crops, I would say. Um, we haven't monitored them all, unfortunately. But it creates bulk density differences, particularly at the surface, um, with the conventional root zone architectures that, and Kiara touched on that before with some root zone architecture comparisons, you're getting um, an re-aggregated and penetrated soil that is full of labile and resistant inorganic, uh, resistant and inert forms of carbon. They're sort of basically, they're creating, they occupy space and let air in. So the uh, bulk density is reduced quite drastically over time at the surface, which is a real bastion there for your infiltration rates, which you can see staggering change in infiltration rates um, in the cover crops um, from the control where we were sort of looking at a, uh, with a set volume of water, probably close to one hour to generate infiltration compared to just minutes. And this is after one, one year. Um, so it gives you an idea of how rapid change can be generated by introducing extra roots into the system. Just on um, 
moisture as, as measured through a capacitance probe um, across treatments. I thought I'd just chuck these guys in because they do show quite a telltale story. Um, I've been looking at capacitance for 20 plus years now. And if you look at the T4 control, um, you can see there that that has a drainage characteristic that speaks of a soil type that readily drains. Um, you can see these are taken randomly within a 24 hour period, these snaps. So they may coincide with an irrigation before an irrigation or just after an irrigation. But at the end of the day, what we're seeing here is that the green control it has a drying characteristic from the topsoil where the water is ponding. Um, straight away, you see that down to 20 centimetres, the soil moisture is tapered back to 20%, whereas in the Lucerne and the other treatments, you can see a much, much, much higher soil water retention. And this is all related to those extra components of soil organic carbon and just the ability of the moisture to be retained as your soil organic carbon levels lift. So it's a fantastic little snapshot there. Both sides show basically a similar sort of trend where the control is trailing based against the actual treatments. And the same for these two treatments here, which show the progress through February and then into the post-harvest phase in March. So in conclusion, um, some great findings from this trial. Um, the cover crops at the Monash site particularly have really boosted the soil, soil organic carbon levels, uh, benefits to infiltration, benefits to soil biology, uh, benefits to yield, most definitely. Um, the cover crops themselves don't necessarily need to be implemented on an, on an annual basis. We've actually had a spell in the last cropping year and dropped them out and still found some really good follow through results. In fact, a lot of the results we looked at today are actually in cover crops, but in the absence of a crop phase. Um, you do need in these systems to manage them early to avoid uh, competition with your vine. Um, the residues are fantastic as a spin off benefit there for providing uh, weed suppression and, of course, Really, what we're really talking about there is just the resumption of a whole soil culture under a mixed root system uh, dynamic. And uh, yes, yeah, certainly the uh, composted organic matter trials are doing quite a good job and um, a little bit more drastic. Um, they sort of more like a, a, an organic hit for the soil. Uh, I think overall between all of them that probably a a balanced mix of both would be the ultimate solution for these vineyards that we're dealing with. And uh, that's it. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeremy. Sorry, I was furiously writing notes while you were uh, presenting. Um, such amazing results. Um, and uh, we have spoken to Kiara about these results um, previously. Um, so we have some questions from, from the participants. So from Brett Hayes, has work been done with a comparison with natives versus introduced reduced cover crops. So Jeremy. Um, we have done some limited stuff. Um, the thing we've found with, um, if we're talking native grasses, um, there's generally, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I've, I've found native grasses a little bit tricky to handle in terms of the, the, seed, the seed sort of type. And um, they can be quite expensive to purchase. Um, so we have done, I would say, patch trials, but unfortunately I couldn't offer you any really good analytics. Uh, when it comes to the woodier species of, uh, you know, when you get into salt bushes and other sorts of those styles of um, options, um, we have done some further work, but we found that you're gonna have to be careful um, with nitrogen and um, toxicities because the natives 
and I won't say this is like uniform across the board, but I have seen numerous fatalities from, uh, you know, say a, a tomentosa sort of enkelina tomentosa, ruby salt bush uh, has been a common one that we've trolled and I've seen it succumb a number of times to nitrogen, what I presume is nitrogen toxicity. So to run them, they'll have to be ideally shielded from excessive nutrient inputs to get a hold in the vineyard, whereas the, you know, the classic sort of cereals and legumes, um, they just, they can cope with the system and if anything, they thrive in the system. So that's not to say we can't do more with natives and we will be doing more with natives um, this year coming. So if you're interested, stay tuned. And I do hope to put some better analytics around them. Thank you. So um, reading between the lines, um, in a riverland situation that is heavily irrigated and fertigated um, in the mid row, perhaps planting some natives um, in the in the mid row may be an option, Jeremy. It will be an option. Um... If you, based on that first picture of that vineyard, we're sort of thinking that it may, in an arid system, to actually get them going where you get persistent years of really dry starts, you may need to pet them up to get them going. Uh, if they're under vine, you should be okay. Though we're talking drip systems here um, specifically. Um, the one thing I did neglect to mention in my presentation was what we're actually doing this year at the trail site is we're cutting out synthetic N uh, in that very crop that we're looking at there now, um, right through until about December, um, because we believe that the ground now has enough capability um, to mineralize N. So if we think about that and the implications also for bringing natives back into the system on the back of maybe previous phases that could have been conventional cover crops. Um, there's opportunities there to fine tune the system potentially, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, great. Uh, so two people, Ben and Duncan, have both asked how you terminated the cover crops in, in the um, study. In the land. Yeah, they were just sprayed out, I believe, with glyphosate. Um, yeah, so that's that's managed by CCW specifically. It's not done by myself, so they were just terminated um, in the sort of late September to early October period. I've got the rates and everything if people want to know. Okay. Mm. So obviously if people are um, organic, they could use an organic fertilizer, uh, organic herbicide to um, burn them off. Definitely. I think, yeah, just bear in mind with this trial that it's got its crusty edges. We're really putting the maximum effort into soil analytics and trying to demonstrate that there's a, a productivity outcome from doing cover crops and uh, composts. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of places where you could really refine it back, so. Okay, um, so obviously uh, other options for terminating that cover crop would be undervine cultivation yeah. or um, even mowing um, mm. to keep it um, yep. the lines in check. Yep. Definitely, yeah, you could knife it or mow it. Yep. Um, there are other options there. Okay, great. Um, so a question for you, Kiara, and maybe Jeremy as well. So does um, the pH of your water source, for example, bore water, have an effect on soil pH? Well, depends on the difference, but normally soil has a, like a huge buffer effect, which is very complex to understand. So unless it's like if you have a soil of eight and you put pH one, then that maybe you see something, but in the amount of water that you put, but I think if it's not too much, you, there. I think Jer may, maybe Jeremy, you have a different opinion, but I don't think like soil have a the buffer of soil is, is quite significant. Yeah, uh, I guess yeah, that's the key factor, isn't it? You know, it's the buffering capacity of that soil media um, once we introduce things, because I mean. 
what I haven't shown you is um, the effects of acidification uh, yeah, in synthetic vineyards. Um, we all know about them, but there's quite abundant changes <laughs> in the soil pH direct under the vine and they're, they're transient changes. So it depends when you measure them, but like in the peak of the season, uh, you'll be fully like a whole point down uh, directly under the, under the drip orifice. Um, and then slowly over the winter period, they don't fully come back, but they they buffer out again because of the calcium in the system. So for the person that asks the question, I would suggest if it's a concern that you actually yeah, monitor your soil pH over time and consider how that impacts on your nutrient availabilities and particularly watch out for salts, of course, with bore water. Yeah. And I guess um, soils with higher buffering capacity, um, if you have higher levels of carbon, um, you know, and also clay and loam soils, they have a higher buffering capacity, correct, compared to um, sandier soils. Yeah, so it really depends. Yeah. 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 The whole okay. dynamic has changed, isn't it? So. Yeah. All right, we've got quite a few more questions. Uh, so Dr. John Russell has said no infiltration rates for aeration drip deep ripping as a comparison with tillage radish. So um, do you have any comments on that? Jeremy. I reckon we did do drip infiltration uh, in deep ripping. Um, I'll just scroll back but if not we've certainly got the data um there's uh yeah well, there's yeah the thing with ripping well there's some there the thing with ripping is that um you can also collapse a lot of your porosity too um you got to be careful when you do a drip infiltration test comparatively in i mean if you want to sample directly over the rip, yeah, you're certainly going to get a result. Um, but we found, as you can see there, that actually ripping, it can improve it, but then it can unimprove it too, depending on uh, the soil type, because you actually, what porosity and pathways you've got there can also be disrupted by the action of ripping, because ripping generally in the trials we're doing, it's having its maximum effect right down deep. It's going right down to sort of 80 centimetres or something like that and hooking back in under the vine. Um, whereas the surface sediments, um, you can see there that the, there's a better drainage infiltration characteristic with gypsum and an even better one with organic matter and gypsum, but the straight rip is actually worse or about the same as the control. So I guess there's another little sort of story there to sell the effects of organic matter, particularly in a ripping trial in terms of the post recovery past the ripping phase in terms of straight infiltration rate. But yeah, certainly it can improve the infiltration rate. So it's not about ripping per se, but about what you do with that rip line. So um, pumping in organic um, matter into that rip line certainly increases the infiltration rate. I really love this graph uh, um, looking at the, the radish. Um, it really shows that long term impact of, of cover crops on, um, on improvements in soil infiltration rate. Mm. So moving on, um, what are your thoughts on applying manure, so chicken manure with composts, Kiara? Um, I, I think it's fine, but the first thing you need to check is how much nitrogen has your soil. And also if you want to do, if you want to measure, if you want to do some uh, carbon light neutrality certification, you have to pay attention that manure can spike up your uh, emission of N2O as well so it depends like but yes definitely you can use it and just pay attention on the nitrogen and that you have in your soil and how much also <laughs> if you want to do carbon accounting that could affect a lot your emissions great yeah. thank you and now if you jeremy did you try to use manure no that's the next trial phase we'll look at manures the only thing with manures that i'm worried about is um it's the manure miles i guess we'd call it like what we're 
what we're trying to do is go sort of carbon savvy and not mm. we're trying to minimize the distance that product has to travel to mm. uh, site and um and the other thing i'm conscious of too is that um competition like if we pick on the riverland district competition for manures and compost has gone through the roof and uh, I won't claim to be the sole proponent of stimulating that, but certainly in the last four to five years, it has really gone through the roof and we're actually seeing some new people coming into the business to try and keep up with the supply. Um, the only thing that worries me about, of course, is the inevitable qualities, um, what people are putting on. And um, I'm actually a really big advocate of growing it on site if you can do it, to be honest. I just think the soil's got the capacity to do amazing things, and um, but it's going to take a bit of time. But there's no, no problem with putting on a compost. But get it tested first before you put it on. That would be my advice. All right, wonderful. So moving on, thank you. Uh, so this is really at the crux of, of this whole uh, webinar, I think. So Neville Rowe, thank you for your great question. Um, so Neville was really interested in Jeremy's, um, a graph in Jeremy's presentation showing the relationship between increasing soil carbon and water holding capacity. And I'm really throwing this question to Kiara. Um, so, um, <sighs> Is there work that shows how far this relationship can be extended? And, um, and this really comes down to your carbon modelling, but also can we model changes in water holding capacity um, for different soil types um, based on increases in soil carbon? Uh, that's the, so currently, most of the models, they don't account for that. Some of the new ones, they start including it, but it's very complicated because you need to change the structure of soil over time, which makes very complex computational effort to do it. But yeah, generally speaking, they've been doing some simple models to just gather a lot of experiment field data and, uh, and create a model on field data. So it's been quite... It's, it's quite been like the, the this area has been studied quite a lot and normally speaking yes like i don't think it's this one the picture that he was saying i think it was the one the, the one with the two panels and uh, that one yeah, that one yeah uh generally speaking there is a relationship that increasing how much an increase of carbon can be related to an increase of water, which I don't remember by heart at this moment, but I can have a look and <laughs> send it to you. Uh, but yes, the, now we are trying to move to understand if we can incorporate in better models that capacity, that feature as well. But for right now, the only very empirical and simple model can do it. And it's just about like giving your type of soil. So how much uh, what's your composition in terms of clay and silt and how much carbon can you stock and the variation and can give you how much you can increase in terms of water holding capacity. I'll tell you um, what growers can do, and I've done that at field days before, is if they bring in a set volume of soil or two set volumes of soil in like a a can that you get like kidney beans in or something from the shops and they pay attention to you know extracting it whole without disturbing the core then then what we can actually do is sort of we do this sort of thing where we actually could infiltrate it with some like a kelp humate mm -hmm. and then when they're both dried then we can then what we've done is we've done like set volume tests over the top and you can see straight away that the one with the, the treatment will just hold more moisture before it drains into like a petri dish or something like that and that can sort of give people an idea of the sort of scale that is not it's not necessarily a huge scale that needs to be applied in the first instance to achieve quite a a uh, beneficial change in the soil type so um That's this. Right. Yeah. 
Um, so moving on, so Pru Henschke has asked, would you recommend using Humate applications during spring? So first I'll uh, invite Kiara to give her thoughts on this one. Uh, I, yeah, I think spring is a good season because temperatures are been perfect for bacteria and everything so you can recirculate nutrients start recirculating have material to grow and be ready and start preparing the soil i think there's a good if you can start managing your soil also during winter time preparing it so more carbon as jeremy said can help you to hold more water so if you releasing carbon during winter that can help you to start holding water there already and then keep doing spring as well. That will be perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jeremy, from your trial work? Yeah. So um, keep an eye on your carbon to nitrogen ratios, um, assuming that they're, they're looking good. Um, what we're generally finding is that the biology lives on in the ground. And in terms of the metabolic energy and what it's going to require to break down, I assume that there might be a bit of a concern there in terms of potential impacts on on vines at startup it really comes down to basically making that call if you've got the energy in the ground through the through the microbes and they've got an adequate nutrient supply and you're confident in your nitrogen mineralization levels then i would suggest that as long as the humo applications aren't too excessive um, that you're not going to have a problem and if anything it will just bolster your microbial communities up at a critical time where they can actually really be of high benefit to the vine. But it's always a scale thing, isn't it? So if you're going to go and really into a system that might be a bit sleepy or, or sort of um, not quite up to the task and you, you, you know, it's like us, if I gave you a, a roast dinner on a Sunday Arvo and, and then sort of wanted you to go and sort of climb Mount Lofty is sort of quite sluggish, but if you if you're energized and you've got the metabolic energy to digest it and still perform well, then great. So it's about measuring the potential of your soil, and I'd encourage people to do that through a bit of biological testing of their soil type to not just you know see the classic mineral contents. You actually want to understand more about the density and characteristics of your biology, and then how they react in a repeat cropping phase to different scales of humate application if that's what you're actually aiming to do. Mm, wonderful, thank you. So a question, ryegrass and medic versus mm. radish. So mm. which is better? Um, and would you wait for the cover crops to, um, to for their seeds to ripen? before terminating the crop? Question for you, Jeremy. Yeah. So two different gigs there in terms of crop types. With tillage radish, I personally would be almost just inclined to just let it senesce and die back naturally. I don't find that it's that hugely competitive, um, that it becomes an issue and it's generally petering out by, by the time the vines are starting up. If you allow it to set seed and you allow the heads to actually collapse, they form quite a good uh, vineyard sort of a uh, vine row sort of matting, which is, as I said before, a suppressive to weeds. And then you've got a self-regenerating cover crop option into the next season. But with Medic Ryegrass, um, she's too competitive. You, you got to knock it out. And um, the best results come from a a fairly dense sort of sowing um, of that particular combination. It is at the moment our best yielding um, treatment and a good performer in, in many, in many, many ways. But definitely we've found both with the loose and the medic ryegrass, they do actually have to be knocked out of the system. Um, but if you knock them out, Generally, by that time, you'll find um, that the medic particularly has has set seed and um, it self regenerates the same sort of scenario. So wonderful, thank you. Um, and Kim Macbeth loved this question. So why should you cut your cover cover crop or terminate your cover crop um, in spring? Why not just leave leave it to grow so it creates its own moisture and build soil carbon and mm. Um, mm. <laughs> oh, look 
You know. This is a real question about yeah. how much of a yield penalty are you um, willing to take um, to build yeah. soil carbon? Yeah. It also depends on your water availability and nutrient mm. availability. I yeah. guess if you don't have any problem with water and your soil is pretty moist, I think it's fine. Yeah. But yeah. if you have also nutrient availability, it could be a problem. Yeah. I don't know if you if you had any trial, Jeremy. Like we we did uh, the year before last, and we 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 had to pull the pin, albeit late, because the what it what it really gets back to, and uh, yeah, I mean it's a great question, but it really depends once again on the energy in your system, the capacity of your system. You might be in a different part of the world with a you know really pumping soil and uh you know between the vine and the cover crop there is really enough potential energy and nutrient and moisture to drive both of them to create this really great symbiotic sort of scenario but in the good old riverland which is arid as um it quickly becomes apparent um by about late September, October, depends on the season that even with drip irrigation, um, there's, you know, they've both got boxing gloves on and they're, they're both sort of looking at each other really sort of aggressively. And we found if we let them go in that system, because that system is limited, that just for that system, that the canopies were shrinking on the vines and then the, the, the nitrates and everything in the end levels uh, were just yeah, you know, shrinking drastically at the PDLs, and then resultantly there was a huge yield penalty. So that doesn't mean that you can't do it, but what it might mean for that arid system is that you actually have to build a lot more soil functionality for a few years before you actually take that step to then allow it to go the full season. Um, it's just a question of time and soil potential. So. I love that. Mm. And this is really what we're talking about, you know, um, there's always concerns about cover crops um, competing with vines for water and nutrients. But I guess what you are both showing is that with good cover crop selection and management um, and time, um, they can really start to build soil carbon levels and start adding, uh, providing more water and nutrients. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so here's another great question uh, from Dr. John Russell. Um, so many vineyards are located on shallow soils, say 20, um, 20 mils deep, uh, overlaying hard gravel subsoil. Um, mm. I'm not sure which region you're in, John, but um, so how relevant is what is what has been discussed? And I guess um, even if you have a shallow root system, um, you have this capacity to, to grow out if you can get water and nutrients um, mm. uh, at a wider depth, uh, wider um, width. <laughs> um, Jeremy, Kiara, any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, um, tread very carefully. Um, to in the early phases, it's what we've got to remember is a lot of Australian soils. Um, they weren't big producers from you know, year zero. Like they had quite sort of small productivity systems in in their native in their native history in their past. So we're actually we're pushing soils to go to new places to get productivity outcomes. Um, so in a, in a situation like that, and I don't know, yeah, you know, Kira might may or may not agree, but. I would actually be inclined to probably apply a surface mulch that actually didn't have any competition aspect and probably at a low rate introduce a, a kelp humate or something in the early years to actually build passively my carbon resources. Um, and I mean a low rate to start with um, and see how the biology and the productivity of the vine reacts initially and cover crops might be within five or so years from actually repeating that process. Um, it'd be a very, yeah, that's a very shallow root zone. And um, 
if you introduce something into it without knowing your rainfall levels and the, you know, the solar radiation and everything else, you could actually go backwards pretty quickly. So I'd, uh, I think actually go the other way and actually don't stress the vine, actually improve the soil and then see what you can pull out of that through analytics and then make the step towards um, probably something like a tillage radish that's going to be a bit of a, a compaction buster. Because, yeah, we have to build soil condition and it, unfortunately it just takes time. So, yeah. 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 Act that you were talking about, Kiara. Keep going. Yeah, no, I agree uh, with Jeremy. You need to do baby step at the beginning, and you can't plant straight away a cover crop. It won't survive. There's not energy. The soil doesn't have any energy to support it. So I think building step by step, going with small rates, and once after five years, unfortunately, yeah, carbon goes really slow to build this. Not like nitrogen. The, the cycle is really, really slow. And after five, probably even more years, I can mm. think to start with a cover crop. That will help, I guess, also for soil erosion. Will mm. help to hold the soil a little bit more and lose it. Like for heavy precipitation, maybe it can help to hold mm. more water and hold the soil as well. Great. Yeah. So this real, um, it's not a short term, there's no sh short term solution. Um, and I think, you know, given that we are in most regions, we have quite a lot of moisture in the system at the moment, you know, people could be wondering about why they're even um, focusing on um, things like improving the um, uh, water infiltration rates and, and sorry, the water storage of their soil. But mm -hmm. we know that it takes a long time. So what they, can, what they do now is really going to build that resilience in the soil for drier seasons that we know mm -hmm. will eventually yeah. come. Yeah, uh, wonderful. Thank you both very, very much. It's been a really great session. Um, I hope everyone has, uh, well, I'm sure everyone has gotten a lot from both of your presentations. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to everyone who participated, loved all of the questions that came through. Um, so also just reminding you that this webinar has been recorded, so it will be sent out to you. Uh, the next AWRI webinar is next week. Uh, it's on grapevine trunk disease management for vineyard longevity. Uh, so you, if you haven't already registered, uh, jump on and register for that. Um, thank you, Kiara and Jeremy. Much, much appreciated. Uh, lovely to chat to you um, as always. And thank you to everyone else. All right. Thank you. Thank you.